Okay, folks, if we can get started, please take your seats. Sign in sheet somewhere over here in the center. It's working its way around. Please make sure you sign in uh, before we go today. So I'm going to, folks, can you sit down, please? Yo, take your seats, please. 545, I got to get started, okay? Thank you. We're going to start by picking up with lecture 16, maybe lecture 17, depending how far we go. Roughly, roughly an hour or so for the lecture. The balance of the time uh, will be for follow-up on lab two, part two, or phase two today. So I do have a team that wants to be first. So we're going to start at number two and go from that point. Uh, but we'll call that out later today, okay? All right, update your file. Submit it on Canvas, label it phase two by midnight tonight, please. And what are we doing Wednesday? Test three, right? And everybody saw the posting announcements, what's going to be on the test, right? What you can bring to the test, all of that. So please get ready. Get caught up with your homework. Homework that you know is going to be on the test. I'd try to make sure that I have it done before I sit for the test. I don't know what John is doing for any kind of help session or not. I've talked to him a couple of times, tried to get that started. Has he contacted you with any kind of help session? Track, no, okay. Send him an email then ask him if he's got something scheduled for tomorrow maybe, see what he can do. I did update the test file three with a answer key problem for past test three. So that's been available to you as well. You can take a look at that. We did have good results last time. Average test score to second test score went up four points. That was good. Healthy in the mid 70s range. So I know some of you are making progress, tracking better. So that's good. Keep it up. After that, test three, um, really, we've got to finish up this lab two. And we'll have a lab three problem. But the lab three, don't worry, is not that long. It's not that complicated. Uh, it will be a shorter assignment that'll wrap up the end of the term. And we have finals on Monday the 11th, correct? And I believe that's roughly 6 p.m. or close to 6 p.m. on the 11th. Is that right? Yes? Those who've looked it up. Okay. I know you have studio reviews finals week, but there should not be anybody having a conflict on that day. We've tried to check that out. Okay. All right, let's take a look at today. Today we're gonna to move on to two lectures on domes, forces and stresses in domes, how do they behave? Uh, so we'll do some sample dome uh, force problems in class, pro well, I don't know if we're doing in class problem or not, we'll see. Uh, con uh, conoidal parabolic or do uh, parabolic domes, what their behavior is like, sample problems. We'll assign some homework. Uh, we'll talk about the types of domes based on their materials, their framing and shape. Uh, those who bought the textbook, uh, there is a section on domes that very well matches up to the lecture content here. And some of the homework that we're doing is actually based on homework from the text as well. And it is all updated on Canvas for you. So one of the first 
types of domes is a monolithic or solid shell dome. They're typically made of concrete. Uh, they're defined as a thin shell, as a shell of thickness T, where the rate, where the radius that generates the shape divided by T is greater than 20. And R is considered the minimum radius of curvature. The thickness of the shell may vary across its surface. It may vary across its surface because forces are changing in magnitude. Typically, the forces are less at the top because the system is not carrying as much weight, but they're more at the bottom because more loads are being transferred to the bottom, so thickness tends to increase. Domes are considered self-supporting structures. They take the form of an arch distributing external loads, but sort of like an arch rotated in 360 degrees around the sides and down to the foundations. They're tightly compacted by gravity and other external loads carried in compressive forces that develop internally. So domes in concrete, domes in uh, um, uh, masonry type units are fairly common. Anybody recognize the dome on the right? History class starts with the letter P, Pantheon, okay. Notice it's actually has a sort of coffer-like recess in the dome. It's kind of like a waffle slab. That's to reduce the uh, thickness and the mass of the dome, um, create some efficiency in its shape profile as well. And the domes do have what's called horizontal thrust. So imagine like an arch, they have the push out condition of the base. So they typically have to be strengthened and reinforced to stop that outward thrust. The action of the weight and the external forces of the structure can create this line of thrust. A line of thrust, which defines the equilibrium point between the resultant of the compression forces within the structure against the external actions acting on it. A line of thrust is required to stay in the middle third of an arch to ensure stability. We saw that earlier when we were talking about arch structures and same idea here, basically, you would like the line of thrust of the section cut, which looks like an arch to be in the same condition. So if you look at the upper right-hand side, you see a thick dome could have been made of masonry or concrete. The line of thrust is shown there uh, at the top, the dark line. And notice that the line of thrust generally stays within the shape. That's a good condition. If it starts to break out of the shape, either going to the left-hand side or the right-hand side, that negative condition means tension is forming in the dome. And you could have a failure condition re resulting from tension unless the system is heavily reinforced. And of course, today we still have, we, we have steel tension rods there, but in some cases, the, the past domes, they did not really have steel tension rods. Sometimes they had horizontal chains that went circumferentially around the dome. Um, and that was the way of counteracting thrust forces that could be causing collapse. So if you look at the lower right-hand side graphic figure one, you're seeing the two types of force conditions. And that's this one here. Meridional forces are these, and they're moving in this direction. So these are essentially the arches. These are called the meridional, meridional lines or meridional elements. These are in compression. They're always in compression. There's no other force condition other than compression. They tend to have the smallest force generally closer to the top, but they'll have the largest force generally at the ground. The second element is uh, N sub phi. This is the hoop force. So these are a series, in the case of a circular dome, these are a series of circles that radiate from the top, center point, and they're obviously increasing in radius or diameter as you get towards to the ground. Now, these can be in compression or tension. We'll talk about when that shift occurs and what that means. The analysis of a shell is concerned with these two stresses, those in the meridional direction and those in the parallel direction. The parallels are called the hoops. And so you're seeing on the right-hand side sort of that force flow with the arrows going downward that represents our force condition. So continuing with earlier work and research, we'd see that forces in the shell are considered to be only tensile and compression, as we've talked about, based on the assumption the surface has no stiffness against bending. So essentially, they're not designed to be resisting the bending forces. And the ideal situation would be one where typically you have uniform or uh, uniform, but ideally compression forces throughout. So we talked about this notion of a, a suspended cable system, and that from Robert Hooke we talked about the notion when we were looking at arches and cables earlier that if you take the shape of form in a pure tension element such as a cable uniformly loaded, you flip it upside down, 
the same element uniformly loaded could be a compression element, in this case, the sort of arching element that you see here, which is a slice of the dome. A uh, lower form, a lower profile shape would be the catenary. These are smaller slope conditions. And one of the problems that we see with these is these generally have more lateral thrust conditions acting outward, higher magnitude lateral forces going on, where the steeper slopes still tend to have less. Um, the steeper slope ones will also be impacted more by lateral loads like wind. The smaller ones like this will be less impacted by wind because they're aerodynamic, so to speak. So the equation one is starting to generate some of the equations that we're talking about that would examine the conditions of compressive stress. And N, as you see on the equation two down below, representing our, in a sense, sort of total load area force coming down represents W times A. W is our load, let's say pounds per feet. A is in, uh, representing um, conditions of self-weight. The self-weight loads are evacuated in the load per unit area where W is rho times T. From our earlier formula discussions, the meridian of the spherical dome radius A points around the meridian are represented by the angle phi and the distance R from the vertical. And the following relationship says here, R is equal to A sine phi. In order to examine stress patterns, we would say what's called an infinitesimal element. So most uh, sort of theory explanations that are given in structures are based on some infinitely small element. So it's not a particle, it's not a molecule, but it's considered a very small element that makes up the materials and the conditions of the structure itself. So n sub phi here, n sub theta here, these are meridial forces. These are our tension or compression forces on the hoop or the parallels. And this force is representing our gravity weight going downward. So if we look through the formulas here, we'd say our d sub phi or d and divided by d sub phi here, where d sub phi is this angle. D would be the total angle from the center all the way to the ground is n sub phi sine phi minus n sub theta cosine phi or w, negative w sine squared phi. We could simplify that to n sub phi plus n n theta is equal to negative w cosine phi, or the formula that we use is the bottom one, equation six. n sub phi is equal to wa divided by one plus cosine phi. So what are some of the failure modes in solid shell domes? Well, one is insufficient thickness. So there's not enough material there to take our compression forces. Roughly minimum thickness should be 4.2% of, of our radius, so to speak. Buckling. Um, there are problems with buckling when they have non-uniform loads at times. It's possible that um, changes in curvature or shape could create buckling. It's also possible that concentrated loads can create buckling, and the system has what's called a localized buckling at one region or area. Uh, too great a slope. Uh, the dome is too tall and not wide. So the angle of, uh, it was called internal aspect angle, is generally less than 20 degrees is not viable in design. There needs to be a greater slope condition. The internal forces, overall the membrane and plane tens and for tensile forces are low. They can be supported by minimal reinforcement, but there are cases where some of these elements can be over overburdened or there's too much force going on and these can cause cracking. Generally, these are concrete dome surfaces. So we have what are called the edge forces. These are bending and shear. And so if we take a look at the upper right-hand side, we see some of the possible dis distortions or, or, or force conditions calling the dome to come apart. And you notice they're largely at the bottom and that's because magnitude and load carries down to the bottom. So the largest force conditions are there. Cracking of domes could also come as we talked about earlier. This was the same reference we made St. Peter's Cathedral, 1747, uh, on the right-hand side, studying the location of the thrust line. The idea was to create a cable system that represents uniform load, and then inverting the cable, seeing if this shape for the dome, all of the materials laid or would lie with inside that thrust line. And since they do lie inside the thrust line, you know, it's somewhat safe to not have a tens tensile failure that the 
dome elements that make it up concrete or stone would all be in compression. Now in this St. Peter's tomb, there's actually some horizontal change, chains that were made of steel that wrap around the bottom. And that's to help contain the hoop forces from pushing outward, which you kind of see up here. Now, geometric properties of domes. The shape or profile of dome can vary in height, span, and radius described based on the shape. And for our purposes, a number of domes are generally spherical, meaning they're, drawn, they're developed by a circular arc segment. So typically domes do have a shallow profile and our generating radius of the curvature is R, capital R is equal to L squared plus 4H squared over 8H. L is the horizontal span of the dome, diameter base. H is the height, and R is the generating radius that generates that circular shape. Spans usually determined by spatial requirements, how much height, how much area do you need. A solid shell dome, those are the ones we're going to talk about now. These are the earliest forms. They're made of concrete or various forms of cement. Their approximate thickness ratio is lowercase t, capital R divided by 600. The surface area of the roof, that's how we're going to generate our load. Uh, sort of shown here, A is equal to 2 pi RH. Uh, interior volume is not something we would calculate, but there's a volume calculation for you. The key geometric parameters are shown here. So H is the height above grade. This is from this point to this point to the cap or the crown. That's where the tangent point of the surface of the curvature is parallel to the ground. And our generating radius is this one. And obviously this is a circular condition. This is a circular ge defined geometry. And this would be our cutoff point, so to speak. This is the point where the, uh, the dome starts at the ground and moves upward from that point. This internal aspect angle that you see here, uh, this is marking, if you will, that internal angle that mark marks that point where the cutoff occurs. Capital L is our span. This is called the axis of revolution. So in other words, pure vertical axis right through the center, 90 degrees to the ground and 90 degrees to the top of the dome, which is tangent to the ground. Um, you could rotate rotate all of those uh, arch segments together. That would be the point of rotation to create the dome form. Structural behaviors. Uh, dome transfers forces through two primary paths, top to bottom. Those are along our meridional lines. And remember, these are compression. And then they also move along our parallels in this direction. And those could be compression or tension. There's also shear forces. We're not going to be addressing the shear forces in this class, but there are present shear forces in the dome elements as well. And so if we take out a piece of the dome, we're going to see something like this. And at this point, high on the dome in elevation, our horizontal hoop forces are in compression. But I took another segment down here, and these are in tension. Now, what is the change that is occurring and where does it change? Well, the point in which you change from compression up above to tension down below is this one. If you take a look at the internal generating angle from the center point of the dome and measure down 52 degrees from the vertical, that's the transition point. So from here up, you've got your compression, but from here down, you have your tension. The compression forces are increasing magnitude and you're starting to push out at the base and that's creating some of these tension forces which could cause fracture. A reinforced concrete dome three inches thick can limit deflections up to one divided by 12,000 of its span where a beam would only be one over 360. Well, why is that? Domes are inherently more efficient shapes. Uh, uniformly loaded, as you notice, they look like a moment diagram in cross-section. I, I sort of won't have time to go over this one, so probably won't do that today. Here is our compression rings that are shown across the top, our tension rings down below, our meridional forces all in compression, largest, smallest magnitude at the top, largest magnitude at the bottom. Why? Because there's more surface area there, more weight. Our meridians are here, and here is our force condition, and here is our deflection of the dome. Notice it pushes outward. Um, where do you think this point is relative to the internal aspect angle from that vertical line? Where do you think that point right here is? Anyone? I already told you what it was. 52 degrees, right? In theory, as the transition goes from tension or compression to tension, it approaches zero. 
So in a way, you could also look at that as kind of like the neutral axis in beam bending. You know, you switch from compression to tension. Um, then probably the good side about that is that's a region where you don't count on much force. Small forces are there. You're approaching zero, in other words. So stress distribution on a spherical dome carrying a uniformly distributed load. And the surface looks something like this for the meridians. Smaller meridians up here, forces up here, and larger meridians down below. Again, because they're at the ground, they're carrying the largest weight. And what we said a moment ago, here it is, your 50, 52 degree mark, transition from your compression up above to tension down below. And again, the bending stress beam analogy here shows you as the neutral axis, you would say at that point, if this were a beam. So basic shell behavior on the upper right-hand side and the left-hand side diagrams, you could say that on one hand, you've got an internal resisting moment and applied moment. So in a sense, we have a support point here and we have a load acting in this direction that creates clockwise rotation. But then we have the compression hoop forces on the left-hand side going to the left, but on the bottom, the hoop forces are going in to the right, they're in tension, and this is my resisting moment. So those two moments offsetting each other essentially provide equilibrium. So here's our hoop forces top. Uh, sometimes you might even have what's called a tension ring in the bottom. It's a large reinforced tensile element that keeps those forces under control. Uh, sometimes in older domes, obviously, uh, 1200s, 1300s, you might have seen buttressing. So large, has, large massive blocks of stone, masonry, et cetera, were counteracting this lateral thrust condition. Tension rings, um, in some cases, more contemporary domes, you have a high reinforced uh, concrete beam around the bottom, a lot of steel reinforcement, that's a tension ring. Uh, sometimes you have to break them. You know, let's say an opening is occurring at lower portion of the dome, there's a potential case here, this could cause stress conditions. Uh, there are cases where the dome literally gets lifted above the ground. In other words, the tension ring is here. Uh, that's not the, the ground, so it's literally supported by a series of columns along the base. And then you can come in and you can access, enter the dome at any point, eliminating conditions like that. What are called edge disturbances in domes. Uh, these could be causing uh, flexure conditions. These can be causing failure conditions. In a low-profile spherical shell, the in-plane membrane forces to cause the shell edge to contract inward. The ring containing the outward thrust and the radial forces is, is thus uh, tends to expand outward. Interconnected ring and shell rest restrain each other with free movements. This is, can create incompatibilities or bending moments. You've got two different elements trying to move forces in two different directions. Often we'll see shell edges are thickened. We saw that in the cylindrical um, uh, vaults and concrete, picking up some of these additional forces is the thickening elements at the base. Conditions of, of, of dome support could vary. Uh, on the upper left-hand side, this is a fixed connection on the ground. Problem with fixed con con uh, conditions is they do restrain moments, and if moment forces develop, mo most domes aren't really designed for moment forces, they can create some problems. Pinned edges are more common, they're on the ground, they're just gonna transfer forces in compression down to the base. Roller conditions are possible, but remember, they have to have some restraints so there cannot be too much movement. If we do have too thin a shell and too large a load, we can have what's called sometimes that snap-through buckling, the element starts to implode on itself, or high concentrated loads where thin shell surfaces are exhibited Again, a more localized, smaller failure. Our principal lines of stress conditions, these are tensile or compressive. For wind, acting from the right to the left-hand side, purple or blue lines are representing our principal compressive stress conditions, red representing our tension stress conditions. Notice where concentrations occur, larger forces exhibited, where there's larger spacing, fewer concentrations, less stress occurs. If I've got a gravity load dome, pure, just pure gravity loads from up above, I would find conditions like this. Um, center lines being um, tension and the dotted lines being compression. So you might ask some questions, what do you learn from this? Well, if this is the pattern of tension, 
you might find that's where reinforcing is being dispersed through them. So it's counteracting that tension force. Structural behavior. Here's a uniformly loaded dome coming from up above. We have the gravity loads acting downward, which is our internal angle, inter internal aspect angle showing our cutoff point. And pin connected on the ground, we've got lateral thrust pushing outward just like an arch. We have vertical force needed for the counteract the gravity loads. And then we have the resultant of the two. That would be the largest magnitude force as a result of thrust plus gravity. All right, let's go through the basic formulas that we use and how we take a quick look at deriving them. So here's our dome, center of the sphere. We're taking a look at a piece or a slice of the dome. That's what you see on the upper left-hand side. And we have our generating radii here in the middle, r, r is equal to sine phi. We're at some point vertically across the above the lower level. There's a small segment of the dome where this angular measure represents its width, so to speak. Our other angular measure, d sub phi, represents its height. And we have the two forces going here. This is our meridional force here. We have a pure vertical component that's representing its load. This is n sine phi here. All right, on the upper light, left hand side and the right hand side, we do a blow up of that piece. D sub a, um, as you see here on the upper left hand side is equal to two r sub o d sub s, where d sub s is equal to r d. R sub O is R sine phi. And by substitution, our D sub A, that's our area of the surface of this particle, is 2 pi R squared sine phi D. The weight of the dome, W at any point at the angle as phi is measured from the vertical axis to the apex is determined here. The summation of from zero to the angular measurement, W, D sub A, W weight, D sub A is surface area. Continuing that summation formula, the next step, W, D sub A, 2 pi r squared sine, sine phi d sub phi. We can leave the integral sign out because this is a geometrically defined shape. We can calculate that value. We don't need integration. And capital W is our total load or total weight, 2 w r squared times 1 minus cosine phi. The vertical components of the base reactions, v are equal to v is equal to 2 pi r sub o n sub phi sine squared phi. Simplifying that further, and satisfying conditions of equilibrium, V total is W or W times R. So N sub phi sine squared phi is W one minus cosine phi solving for N sub phi. We have N sub phi is W one minus cosine phi divided by sine squared phi. Breaking this down and simplifying it in through elimination mathematics, we can simplify this down to the final form. This is what we use. N sub phi is W divided by one plus cosine phi. A positive values indicate compression. Um, typically when it's greater than 51 degrees and below that, the elevation is negative. So these are our hoop forces. And above that internal aspect angle of 52 degrees, we'll see compression, but below that we'll see a negative sign that represents tension. Our meridial forces here, as we see from up above, um, these are gonna be always compression. N sub phi is equal to two times divided by 2 w, 2 a pi r sine phi squared. We can rewrite that as n sub phi is w divided by 1 plus cosine phi. And our load value is shown here, q r divided by 2 for n sub phi. Our values are PSF or KSF. And our stress could be divided by the area where stress values n, s, f sub m are n sub phi divided by t and l. L is always one inch or one foot because it's a one foot wide slice through the dome. It's the unit strip method you use for concrete and T is the dome thickness. So that's the unit piece that we're looking at for our stress. Our parallel or hoop forces N sub theta are shown here. RW times negative one over one plus cosine phi plus cosine phi, the larger expression. Our N, N sub theta is W or QR divided by two. Again, P sub SF or KSF for loads. And our force, that our stress value, N sub P is N sub theta divided by T time at all. Again, L is always 12 inches. T is always the dumb thickness. So we can get our compressive stress and uh, get our compressive stresses. Um, or 
tension stresses as well to whether we're talking about parallels or hoops. So here's an example. This is a five inch thick concrete dome. It's got a radius of 132, 130 feet. That's the uh, angular radius from the circular arc segment that generates it. It has an internal aspect angle of 40.1 degrees. That's from the centroid or center axis vertically through the dome. Uh, angular measure to where it's meeting the ground or the cutoff point at the base. The meridial par parallel forces at the base with the uniform load is 90 PSF. The cosine P is 40.1 degrees. The 40.1 is 0.76. And the dome is 30 feet above grade. Our meridial forces are times W divided by 1 plus cosine P, 90 PSF for W radius 130 feet divided by 1 plus 0.76. We get 6,648 feet in compression. That's at the ground. We're measuring it at the ground. How do we know we're measuring at the ground? Our value phi is 40.1. If I have a value less than that, I could be measuring it up here. Does that make sense? I could ask you in your test, int, what's the force, for example, at another degree angular measure? Now, could I ever give you an angle larger than 40.1 degrees for this equation? It would always have to be less. Can I give you an internal angle larger than 40.1 if this is my given dome shape? Would that apply, or does it have to be less than in order to evaluate the surface of the dome? Raise your hand if you say less than. You're right, it's less than. Anything larger than that doesn't exist in the dome, right? Got to be less than that. All right, so our resulting stress from the 6648 pound feet divided by 12 inches. Remember, we said that's a uniform slice. That's our uniform slice through the dome. And five inches for thickness means we've got 10.8 PSI. What's our parallels for its conditions like? These are our parallels, right? So, and so theta. Rw, negative one, plus cosine phi, plus cosine phi. Please watch your problem solving. Please inner brackets first to, to outer brackets. If you don't do inner brackets to outer brackets, you're going to have a math problem. Please watch that. And following it through, you notice I'm getting a negative number and a positive number. I get 11,700 pound feet. It's 2,281.5 feet in compression. And, and so... And N sub, uh, N sub theta divided by TL, 2281 pound feet, 2,281 pound feet divided by the 12 divided by five, I get 38.03 PSI in compression. A concrete shell is assumed to have no tensile value without reinforcing. If I wanted to check for let's say reinforcing I could be needing here. I could check the values here. And I, uh, let's just say for my purposes of, of evaluation, that's my value, 2281. I could calculate this figuring out how many number three bars I would need to provide the area. In this case, this is the tension stress contribution. If I had tension, that's what I would wind up needing here at the very bottom. Why do I have to deal with the tension here? Well, this is pushing outward, right? Everybody follow me? You're on the ground and the parallels are pushing outward, so I have to hold the dome together. And this would be the value that I would need to figure out how much steel I need. So I need five number three bars per feet or spaced at roughly 2.5 inches on center. That would be my hoop reinforcing condition on the ground. Um, I'm not going to have you guys solve this in time frame today, just to kind of keep us on track a little bit. So, but we'll take a look at the values here. You can do this with your calculator if you want to check it out. Um, spherical radius is 120 feet. It's a four inch dome. The aspect angle is 48 degrees. Find my hoop and meridional forces at the base of the dome. The load's 100 pounds per square feet in uniform. So N sub phi, RW divided by one plus cosine phi. If you do the math, you should get 7189 pound feet. And the resulting stress, N sub phi divided by TL, 149.8 PSI. My parallel forces, N sub theta, RW, negative one divided by one plus cosine phi plus cosine phi. 
plugging in my values, I get 840.2. And my values for Fs and P for the parallels would be 17.5. Now, you're noticing these are generally larger than these, right? Well, why is that? Well, this is largely the meridians are all in compression doing a lot of work coming to the ground. And that's why we're typically seeing these values be larger here than these values be larger here. Uh, can I ask a quick question? I'm close to 52 degrees. Everybody see that? Everybody see that? My stress value is pretty low, right? 17.5. That's that parallel force on the ground. Right. What if I was at 52 degrees? What would I find out? If I'm at 52 degrees, what you would expect that, par that parallel force to be? In theory, what would it be? Yeah, zero, right? Zero. I'm at that point of inversion. I'm zero bending stress, right? As we talked about that before. Uh, let's take a look at a dome not made of concrete, but made of rigid steel elements. And this is one of the earlier forms of dome, domes named after the engineer from Germany, Schwedler Dome. It's 260 feet span, 50 feet high. There's 35 radial ribs. And there's 22 concentric rings. The radial ribs are the meridians. The concentric rings are the parallels or the hoops. It's made of A36 steel. Dead load's 20 PSF. Live load's 30 PSF. Dome has a shallow profile. I'm not going to be concerned about wind loads. They're neglected. My radius of my spherical cap, based on these dimensions, R squared is equal to R minus 50 squared plus 130. Fortunately, uh, my values drop out here. The problem becomes solvable. Solving for R at 194 feet. Now, would that make sense? Well, if my connection on the ground is 260 feet, um, I do need whatever my generating radius to be obviously larger than 260 feet, right? There wouldn't be any curvature if it wasn't. The angle phi defining the dome base sine is 130 divided by 194.67, and that would be my sine value for that. Uh, originating angle is it meets, meets the ground, and I'd have 42.1 degrees. And my cosine value, because I'll need to use that for the further equations, is 0.742 for the same angle. I'm 50 feet off the ground, 260 feet wide. My arch spacing would be 2 pi times 130 divided by 35, which are the radial ribs. So on the ground, the ribs would these ribs would be 23.36 feet apart. The length of one half the circumference of the dome is 139.31 feet. By this standard formula, again for any circular dome. And the spacing of the 22 concentric rings you would say across the top would be the 139.31 feet divided by 22. That means they're going to they're going to track at 6.33 feet apart along that curvature curving line of the radius of the dome. Uh, they could be used with wood decking for supports between ring uh, elements for purlins. The meridial force is at the base, one plus one divided by one plus cosine phi. Uh, plugging in our values. In this case, though, I'm separating some of the two loads out. Um, as you notice, I have to the left here, 20 PSF for dead load, live load 30 PSF. And so I am handling them somewhat, somewhat differently here with my 20 and my 30. My values are coming out with the live load QR over two here. This is my conventional dead load. Coming together, I get 5,137.5.3 pound feet. The rafter elements or the meridional arches are spaced to 23.36 feet apart. They carry the maximum load at the base. So 5.137 kip feet times the 23.36, that's sort of like their tributary width, gives me 120.1 kips per arch or meridian. If I selected a W10 by 22 steel section, the area would be 6.49 inches squared, its radius of duration. The weak axis would be 1.33 1 inches. My allowable compressive axial stretch, stress, remember the KL over R slenderness ratio. I get 6.33 feet apart. That's how far they are apart before they're connected to one of the ribs. 
times 1 times 12 inches divided by 1.33, I get 57.11. FA, uh, therefore, would be 17.7 .7 KSI. It's going to drop down from the original 21.5 KSI because there's a slenderness ratio increasing its strength, its stress due to buckling. The actual stress F sub phi, N sub phi M divided by A, or 18.5 which kind of giving us a bit of a problem here. We can't go above 17.7 .7 KSI. So the member that we just selected, the 10 by 22 would not be quite large enough. So I need to find something better. All right, so we've looked at circular domes. Let's move on to conoids. So a conoid dome looks something like this for like a ice cream cone sort of upside down. And so if you take a look on the left-hand side, You'll see the basic force conditions, dead load W on the right, live load Q on the left. And at the base, we've got our thrust force again, N sub theta pushing out, pushing out. And then we've got N sub X, that's our pure axial force coming down through these elements here and here. Those will be always in compression. Our internal aspect angle is essentially alpha here and here from the center line. And so our dead loads, N sub, N sub theta, N sub X sine squared alpha divided by cosine or cosine times WX. And our live load is shown here. Rho times R squared is equal to sine squared alpha divided by cosine alpha times Q times X. So here's a conoid a conical shell, 60 feet in height, 30 feet radius. My snow load's 40. That would be my live load. My dead load is 10. That's the one on the right. The members are one inch thick. Notice my live load is always perpendicular to the ground. My dead load follows the length of the member. The angle alpha has a tangent equal to tangent alpha 30 over 60 or 0.5. Alpha is 26.56 degrees. That's my internal angle here. Sine alpha is 0.45, cosine 0.89. My actual member length, this incline member, just doing this basic trig at 60 and 30 tells me its actual length is 67.08 feet. Why do I need that? Because that's the path over the dead load. You have to know how much material is there over that path. So here's my dead load calculation, 10 times 68.08 divided by two and times 0 .8, 0 0.89 is my cosine. On the right-hand side is my live load, one half times 40 PSF times 67.8 divided by the 0.45 and 0.89. Here are my two values finally coming together. I get 1,055 pounds per foot as my load. And my stress condition acting on that member, it's a 12 inch by one inch uh, member, would be 87.93 PSI in axial compression. The last generic type is a paraboloid. Here's a paraboloid shell. And this is a curvature element, typically a sort of like a Y squared curvature function here. Our generating radius is capital R again at the ground. And at any point along the surface, we would have some point X and an internal aspect angle. If we wanted to find stress at any point, we'd have to know this location, X, and we'd have to know the internal aspect angle to find out stress here. But here we can just typically use our base radius for R for any stress condition on the ground, or force condition on the ground. So we have our our force pure axial compression tangent to the slope at this point, and we have our lateral thrust force and some theta here pushing outward. And so for our dead load and live load calculations are shown here. And here's a concrete paraboloid shell. It's a radius of 20 feet at the base. The height's 50 feet. The shell is three inches thick. Concrete weighs 150 pounds per cubic feet. There's a snow load, live load of 40 PSF, maximum minimum stresses of the shell. We're going to take a one inch, one foot wide slice strip. F is 50 feet, R is 20 feet, C is 20, 20 divided by 50 or eight for our calculations here for forces and stresses. The maximum force occurs at the base where R is equal to 20 feet. And K is our parameter here for our force calculation, two times 20 over eight or five. So and to be max here, plugging in our values, this is our self-weight. This is my concrete shell, 150 pounds per cubic feet, multiplied by its thickness, divided by 12, inch, 12 inches. That's its total weight. 
our value for C is eight feet. And we divide that by six times five squared, our K value for K is five here. And the rest of the side on the right-hand side is taking into effect our live load as well. So we get 1341.8 plus 408. Our, Self-weight's really doing all the load contribution here. 1341, our other live load, 40 PSF, is not much. And so we get a total load of 1749 pound-feet. What's the actual stress? Well, we're going to take a slice one foot wide, three inch thickness, distribute that load over. We get 48.61 PSI. And sub theta, as you can see here on the left-hand side, my lateral thrust is taken here. We break it into two parts, dead load plus live load. Values are negative in tension because we're pushing outward and we're exerting a tension force, so to speak, on the shell. And so we've got negative, I'm sorry, and our live load does not contribute uh, that, only our, our dead load does contribute that. So our live load's small enough not to contribute much. So we have a net 177.41 pound feet. Our stress is force divided by area. We get a tension stress, negative 4.93 PSI, not very large, probably not needing much steel at all on the bottom. Now, what happens if this got shallower in profile? Well, this value would go up. So we're gonna, we're gonna get into larger magnitude forces and more steel reinforcing. Uh, what do some examples of these look like? This is in Houston, Texas, Cockrell Butterfly Center. This was a uh, conoid dome, but it's truncated. In other words, it's cut at some point here. These are steel trusses with steel trusses vertically and steel trusses horizontally as the hoop members. Uh, this is another one. It wasn't built. It was a famous architect, 1999. They wanted to do an outdoor sculpture pavilion for this museum, and it was going to be made of a fiberglass plastic. This was going to be this outdoor exhibit sculpture space, but it was not built. All right, homework, uh, textbook, roughly the 400 sections, 413, 425, 434, 45. Um, these are from the references from the book, 12.1, 12.2, 12.3, 12.4, the bonus, but those were recreated for you. They're in Canvas already, so those statements have been paste, asked, pasted in, so to speak, into Canvas, so you know what the equations are. And the problem, example two above, reevaluate. Re the base of the dome, if the aspect angle goes to 45, tell me how it's different from the reaction values that are there. Examine a concrete dome, 100 foot radius, thickness four inches, aspect angle of 45 degrees, doing heart and shell, and um, value of concrete, paraboloid radius. Oh, I think these are, sorry, I think the 12, 1, 2, and 3, 4 are all here. And I think the bonus one is uh, given in your uh, canvas as well. All right. So those are our general solid dome calculations made of concrete. The last, por the last portion of this lecture is looking at more frame domes, although I did we, we did take a look at one Schwedler dome, sorry. Um, this is a dome that you would say is a myriad of frame elements. Um, in this case, this is a steel dome. This is made of basically, uh, you call it a space frame system. Uh, it's sort of like a half dome on the right-hand side and a sort of vertical wall space frame on the right left-hand side made of space frames and trusses. This is an outdoor, uh, sorry, indoor sort of botanical garden. So domes made of steel or aluminum elements look like this. The earliest ones were a rib dome. That's the upper left-hand side dome. On the right-hand side, we see what's called a trib, trimmed rib dome. Now, what's the difference between this and this? Well, if you notice, there's large panels here and there's smaller panels here, right? And the loads are larger up, here, smaller up here, but larger here, at least for uh, meridian elements. So the point I'm making is you are not having a very uniform load distribution because the panels are larger and the magnitudes are also larger as you go through it. But the trimming condition creates more uniformity in the panel sizes. And you notice there's actually sort of large, somewhat larger panel sizes here, but smaller here. So now you're starting to even out the forces. In other words, these elements more, are more likely to be the same cross-section than these elements would have been. So for purposes of creating more uniformity here, evenness of loading, they're starting the trimming measure is basically introducing smaller panelizations. 
little melodome. You can see the elements sort of radiating out, and then you have sort of these rhomboid configurations here. Uh, the same lamellodome, but now trimmed with more um, smaller panels and then larger panels at the top, again, to even out forces. And the Schwedler dome is shown below on the lower left-hand side from Germany. In cases here, the problem is we don't have triangulation for the most part here. We've got a little bit of triangulation here, but most of the time we don't have triangulation. Therefore, we would not be able to have pin connections throughout these pieces. <laughs> the Schwedler dome introduced a triangulation diagonal here. That means now all of those panels are stabilized by the diagonal, so they're like a truss. And now you can have pin connections throughout the frames. And on the right-hand side, the Schwedler dome now trimmed. Again, unifying uh, smaller panelization throughout, but some larger panelization where loads are smaller, evens out forces. Now the next set of domes are moving into the, let's say, the 20th century. These are referred to as dimatic domes. So these are made up of triangles. Most of them are not completely uniform, even though they look uniform. And then we have uh, the two diamic, uh, dimatic domes on the upper left-hand side and the right-hand side are two examples. And then we move into Buckminster Fuller and the geodesic domes. This is an, Fuller's geometry to create spherical surfaces or, or dome surfaces. And again, these are triangulated. All these elements are pin connected, but they're not as uniform as you think. These elements do have some varying sizes. And then geod geodesic domes on the right-hand side, but as sort of uh, six-sided figures, um, they're not gonna be pin connected because they're not triangulated. So we have to have either rigid connections or some sort of surface membrane across them to provide stability. And obviously domes don't have to have circular conditions at the base, but they can be created with linear elements. So framed shell and pneumatic domes. Um, so here is our rib dome condition made of steel with arches, rounds at the, day, at the apex. Toyota Sea Life Park. <laughs> These are steel trusses, the big meridians. And uh, I think these are just steel beams for the sort of parallels. Schwedler dome here. Uh, this was a church under construction in Livonia in 2001. So when you look at it at the outside, you see what looks like masonry, what would have been a masonry constructed dome, but it's really not. Um, if you got inside during construction like I did, you would see it's a large steel, steel sections that are the, pray, the main arch elements and then cross-sectional elements and then diagonal bracing. So it is a Schwedler dome. Lamella domes are various forms of these sort of frame dome systems with the curvilinear elements, the sort of rhomboid shape elements in the middle. These have been used for long span domes from the 1960s and onward, covering stadia. This is a dome by Pierre Luigi Nervi. This is referred to the Palazzo della Sporto, means the small sports palace. And here we see some interesting connection conditions. We've got these sort of Y-shaped columns here. And then we have an elevated tension ring down below at the ground and then columns supporting that down below. And you could enter and leave the dome at any one of those locations because you're not interrupting the dome surface. You're not, you know, you're not weakening the dome at that point because you really don't penetrate it. The dome is really above ground. It's 194 feet in diameter, 69 feet high with seating for 5,000 people. And so these are sort of the dome statics calculations that were done to analyze it. It's total downward force, two main, 600 pounds. My reaction forces you know, sort of at the ring condition up above would be uh, 97,000 pounds in stress and stress this uh, thrust that has to be taken. And those that uh, force that's being taken is literally a large concrete ring dome at the base where the forces are transferred through these Y columns, Y columns here and here. And that large beam at the ring beam at the base, which you would walk over, you wouldn't see that as you enter the dome, that's being placed with a, a tension force. The vertical reaction is 74,000. They're calculating the angle subten sub, uh, subtended by the buttresses here. So they know each segment. And then they've been able to calculate the thrust segment force, but also the tensile force going around. That's tangent to the 
thrustering at the base, almost a million pounds. Here's our force coming down from up above. Here's my internal um, values here, my internal values here. Now, this dome was quite interesting because it really was at the 52 degree mark for internal aspect angle. In other words, the dome was largely created to be all in compression. These uh, lateral thrust parallel forces were essentially negated or eliminated entirely. Uh, other domes, longer span capabilities, uh, the Kima Washington dome. Notice this is going to be combining two types of uh, force uh, geometries. This is kind of like a folded plate you know, connected to a dome. Another sort of folded plate, this is University of uh, uh, Illinois Assembly Hall. This is where all the commencements are and sports events are. Uh, shell roofs that are designed by uh, Hans Isler. Now, Isler was interesting because he used a modeling technique. So he would create the shape and definition. So this would be a flexible material like nylon stocking. It would be covered with uh, like a plaster Paris. And he had the shape and he would hang it upside down by the four points of support here and here. And so would hang it upside down. It would then create the uniform tension force profile, right? But as the plaster of Paris dried, then he'd let it dry and then he would turn it back upright. And now he would have a uniform compression force profile. In other words, a constant shell thickness was designed in a sense to efficiently transfer the loads across the surface of the system because he knew the loads were roughly equal. So he didn't need to vary the shell thickness in this case, they were roughly equal. Now there are some edge members here as you're creating these sort of opening conditions. And here it was in its final construction on the right. So it's shaped in a way, um, not through the computer, but shaped through modeling. Lamella rib domes in 1964. These are some early attempts to study the use of steel in lamella ribs from the 1960s in this configuration here, similar to Hans Zissler, but not but made of steel, made of concrete. Uh, this is Julius Natter, a Swiss engineer, famous for all of his wood, innovations in wood. Polydome in 1990, 1991. Sort of like a large groin vault, if you will. You can see on the upper right hand side, 227.5 meters on the ground, almost 90 feet, and height is um, 6.8 meters, almost 30 feet. And here's the ribbing elements that make up the, the dome and the wood paneling elements that make up the sections of the panel. This is an exhibition hall, Armstadt, Germany, 1997. There's the large kind of groin vault condition again. You can see the big groin vault elements here, the primary beams that are probably glue lamb, and then the infill pieces, smaller timber sections. Uh, swimming pool dome, sort of like a three-quarter dome, if you will, um, with lamella grid steel, or sorry, lamella grid wood timber elements here for the main um, Meridians and then uh, just simply wood decking spanning between them to create the surface of the shell. A natterer was studying shapes. He just wanted to understand their geometries and he wanted to see what the capabilities were of creating shapes. So this is sort of a pure exploration of just form, finding out what's possible. He was able to create cantilever conditions on the edges. Hippopotamus house in Germany. This is made of uh, by New uh, Miro, the uh, space frame company, these are lightweight aluminum frames that create this glass enclosure for animals. So you can see it's a sort of dome on one side and a dome on the other side. It's sliced with a vertical wall and then there's sort of like a upside down dome which forms the linking curvature between the two. Renzo Piano Path Foundation. Paris, France, this really curious building in the middle of France. No, it's a real building. I know it doesn't look like one, but um, this was a museum for uh, film and the arts. These are enormous glue lamb domes. I think the cladding is a metallic cladding, I think probably like zinc, almost like large uh, shingles. Um, if you're interested in modeling software and analyzing domes, uh, this is something called Carumba 3D. 
uh, works within parameters of or, or software like Grasshopper and uh, Rhinoceros. And you can create the shapes and profiles and you can script and create the scripting to do that, to analyze them. Um, you can get a student license, I believe, as well as located on the right lower right-hand side. I've had known students that have worked with this, experimented with this. Examples of creating these sort of dome-shaped models using kind of advanced fabrication techniques where they're making all the pieces based on their script, fabricating them out of wood, making a test profile or shape of the model. All right, some summary and wrap-up questions. The hoop forces in a frame dome are in tension, compression, or both? Hoop forces, tension, compression, or both? What have we talked about today? Above the 52-point aspect angle, what kind of force is there? We talked about it earlier. What is that? Tension or compression? Compression. You guys are all asleep today. Uh, below that 52 aspect angle, they're in tension. So we have both. And so again, below the 52 angle, we, are, we, we go into the tension condition. For a rigid dome structure, a low aspect ratio would have a high or low lateral thrust force. If it's a shallow, as, a shallow aspect ratio dome, does it have a high thrust force or a low one? Talked about it earlier. Anybody? High. Yes, I got a high on that. For a solid dome, and sub, uh, theta, what is the location of the force maximum? We calculated that location today. It's always at the base, right? That's where all the loads are coming down. It's the largest force. For a solid dome, and so the, what is the force maximum? It's still always at the base. Whether it's a thrust force or meridian force, they're always maximum because that's where all the load's going. The advantage of the, so if I asked you what the minimum would be, the minimum would be what? If the maximum is the base, what's the minimum going to be? Where's the least self-weight? It's not the bottom, it's the top. The advantage of a shallow aspect ratio, a small concrete sports dome, was by Pierre Luigi Nervi. What did it do? It stopped the boom, the, the uh, lateral forces or hoop forces from pushing out. It was at the it was developed around the 52 degree aspect angle mark. That means all the dome forces were in compression. What's the advantage of that? I don't need steel. Essentially, I have a pure compression element. The meridian forces in a frame dome were primarily resisting what? A, B, C, or D. It's only one. What are the arch and meridian forces resisting? What does an arch resist when it's solid? Compression. Okay, got your homework there. Um, how many people do we want to talk to today? I've got one taken. Two, anybody else? Nope. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at our last type of dome conditions here. Lecture two.
All right, so we're going to take a look at uh, frame domes or dimatic domes that are made with sort of like uh, the uh, geodesic dome type frames or dimatic domes. How do we analyze those? Wind loads on a dome, and we'll take a look at what are called inflatable domes as well. How do we use air inflation to analyze them? Techniques. So these grid type domes, as we were talking about earlier, geodesic domes are one example of them. Diamatic domes are the other. They were vetted by Buckminster Fuller. Um, Fuller was concerned about sustainability and human survival under the current, you know, kind of economic industrial conditions. So his purpose was to create the lightest weight structures possible, use the least amount of materials, but could create enclosure. You know, he kind of coined his own term spaceship earth. So that we needed to be able to use resources effectively and efficiently in many ways to minimize scarcity, but also to create structures that did not use much material resources. And so his idea was for these geodesic domes were essentially sort of minimization of material and option, optimum efficiency, if you will. So the root word for geo or geos um, from geodesic is from meaning the geometry of the dome will be similar, similar to a spherical geometry of the earth. Theoretically, all lengths of panel elements would be about equal in length, but they're not really, um, in the case of geodesic domes, they look that way, but they're somewhat varied. Um, some um, some forms, forms and shapes can actually be made of the curv curvilinear in form or shape and profile in the end, but they could be made of flat surfaces. And so if you know soccer balls, right? Everybody see a soccer ball here? Um, why, why are they curved in the end? Well, because they're inflated. But if you looked at each one of the pieces, these would be a straight line segment. It would be a flat surface. It's only through inflation that they form curvature. And so our formulas for developing geodesic domes by Fuller would say V is the number of vertices intersecting points is equal to plus F is the number of faces or surfaces of the pieces. E is the number of edges that they create plus two. So he says you can form or model any surface using this formula. A cube would be described as 8V plus 6F or 12V plus 2 equal to 14. So if you wanted to create these domes using various types of uh, polyhedra shapes, tetrahedron, tetrahedron, octagon, cubes, etc., these would be the formulas that would be used to tell you what these shapes or forms would be like in terms of their first forms, their surfaces, edges, and elements. Uh, one of Fuller's earliest domes is the USA Pavilion Expo 67. Um, this is a um, enormous sort of glazed glass, if you will, kind of greenhouse type structure. It's got two layers. The sort of hexagon is what you see on the outside, but inside it's, it's, it's basically a um, space frame system. It's a series of triangular segments that are on the interior. And you can see those triangles in the form and you see in the photographs up above. There's sort of the inner inner layer of triangulation. Here's the outer layer of the hexagon. A smaller version in Woods Hole um, dome. This is only uh, 55 feet in diameter. This was wood. These are wood frame elements with mylar, which is a sort of fab, uh, a thin plastic sheet, stretched press plastic sheet that would stretch over these. So this was a much smaller dome. It's probably like 30, or sorry, 50 feet in diameter, not very large. More recently, this is the Eden Project in England. This was part of the, the year 2000 celebration that was made in a number of countries. This is an enormous um, botanical greenhouse. It was built on the former mining site that was abandoned, and it's on the south-facing side of a hill. So basically constant sunlight's coming through. So they have a lot of opportunities to create passive solar energy, heating the dome, heating the interior up, but also sunlight for plant growth inside. And this is uh, this is the outer element again. And this is actually called ETFE. If somebody even know that, it's a plastic film. You actually have it on campus. Anybody know where the ETFE is on campus? Your health science is building across the way. When you look at it at night, kind of has that glowing cast to it. That outer shell is the ETFE. Only weighs about 2% of the weight of glass. It's recyclable. Here's where the generating forms and shapes that he was studying. Um, on the left-hand side, this is plan view. So this is the outer cell, the hexagon. 
and then the interior or the below that the diagonal bracing element is is the inner layer here. It couldn't be a pure dome because it's essentially dome domes that interlock. And so when the domes interlock, you have an arch. And so the non space frame or dimatic dome elements are basically steel arches here and here and here, but they are circular. Do you see the circular line segment here? These are the circular radiant arch, uh, arch elements that were used to create the forms or the shapes. Uh, the structure weighs less than the scaffolding used to erect it. It's aluminum plus the ETFE foil and thin rods. Frame dome structure types, again, geodesic on the upper left, lamella in the middle or dimatic on the right-hand side. Geodesic domes, different origin, derived from platonic Archimedean solids. Dimatic domes may be described as pie-shaped triangular sections. They repeat radially around the crown or a center point at the top. Lamella dome, diagonals extending from the crown downwards to the equator of the dome, both clockwise and anti-clockwise rotated directions. They may or may not have horizontal rings. They may or may not have meridional ribs. So dimatic domes, introduction of system behavior, what do they look like? So a couple of exa examples of the, the dimatic dome is on the upper right-hand side, and you can see, you know, basic forms or shapes here, geodesic dome here. So if we look at a dome coming down to the reaction points on the ground, the red lines represent the dome shape. The vertical line represents the reaction at the ground from the gravity loads downward. But this element's at an angle, so it's got a thrust or lateral thrust force outward. It's also, of course, got its gravity load. So V, our base reaction is P divided by N sub S. P is the total, total vertical load acting downward. N sub S is the total number of supports, meaning these bottom pieces that are carrying that load across the surface. The horizontal component of the thrust vector, that's R, where V is divided by tangent phi, where phi is the angle of the slope of the, of the dome surface from the, from the horizontal ground condition. Combining the two equations, we could say R is equal to P divided by N sub S tangent phi. The horizontal lateral thrust force, that's this one here. Uh, sorry, this one here and that one here coming at the base. T is P divided by 2 N sub S tan phi sine phi over 180 N sub S. That's going to give us our lateral thrust. The behavior of frame dome is a concept at a conceptual level is similar to a solid dome. There's a uh, there's a sort of an approximation technique developed in 1965 that's relevant that's referenced here that allows you to evaluate some of these critical load values. It says P sub R our critical load acting down on this pressure applied uniformly across the dome is C times three divided by square root of two times A E R divided by L R squared. A is the cross sectional area of the member. How much? What's it there? E is the module's elasticity. How strong is it? What's it made of? R is the radius of duration of the member based on cross-section. L is the length of the member. How long is it? R is the spherical radius that generates the shape. C is a coefficient. And for most of the dome profiles and shapes, the theory basically says you can find values somewhere between 1.55 to 1.6 as being valid. So an example of a frame dome, it's 220 feet by 50 feet. Um, the actual dome uh, connections are slightly less than 220 feet, 218 feet, because um, they're somewhat inward at their base supports. The dome, dome slope is 36 degrees. That's our generating radii in the middle to the base support. Height's 50. F sub T, this is made of aluminum, so its tensile stress is 19 KSI. Its module elasticity, it's not as stiff as steel. It's roughly a third of it, 10,000 KSI and it does carry a safety factor 1.65. Our spherical radius, R, what gen that generated the shape is L squared plus 4H squared over 8H. Breaking that down, we've got 143.81 feet for R. The average member length needs to be determined. Typical size for these sorts of panel elements for something like this might be aluminum alloy about 0 0.05 inches thick. And the size, the maximum size would be about nine feet for the sheet that would make up these surface elements if you were putting a cladding on it, in other words, not glass, but a physical material cladding. The vertical height of the typical panel can be determined as M is equal to pi R 180 times phi times one sub N. 
N is the number of subdivisions of the triangle of the panels. We set M at nine feet. That's the largest dimension for which this aluminum surface material can be cut spanning. Now, why is it aluminum? Well, the framework is aluminum and it all has to move together thermally. It has to expand and contract at the same time. It has to move as one integral unit. So that's why the panels are aluminum. So running our numbers down, we saw for N at 3.582, and N is 3, 36 divided by 3.582. And so roughly we've got 10 of these elements, 10.5 here for M. The panel cord length, 30, cosine 30 is nine feet divided by X. X is about 10.39 feet, and we've got roughly 125 inches for length. Panels are made of equilateral triangles, meaning internal angles are all roughly 60 degrees. The side angle lengths of the triangles would be, again, 125 inches. You can round that up to 130 inches because even though the formulas suggest the geometries are equal sized triangles throughout, they're not really, they're, they're going to be larger and smaller. So we'll round it up. Loading in the case will be gravity load snow plus dead load, snow load 25, dead load four, total load 29. Member size, member size can be using the following former formula, critical buckling load PCR LR squared over 1.6E. With our safety factor, we get 29 PSF times one foot squared divided by 144 inches squared and 130 inches and radius of, or 1725 inches squared divided by 1.6 times our modulus elasticity E, 10 million, and we're all in PSI inches and pounds for units. And 1.65 is our safety safety factor there. So we get A, A times R, that's the cross-sectional area of the member times its radius of gyration. So you're taking into account two factors, how much material is there to resist compression and what's the slenderness ratio, essentially for buckling, it's radius of gyration. So your units are 7.95 inches cubed. An I6 by 4.03 section has an area of 3.43 inches cubed. Rx is 2.53, the area is 8.6968 inches cubed. That could be conceivably valid to use as a member. Our loading check, the total vertical load P across all the surface areas, where this is our surface area, 37,000, our area is 37,000 feet squared. Our load, 29 PSF times our area gives us 1,082 kips. And so our plan, our plan elements would be about 10.4 feet apart, nine feet vertically spaced apart to the vertical points. There are 64 panels at the bottom as a result of our calculation based on the based on the size of the panel and its total diameter. There are 64 base nodes. Our tensile stress value here, T is P divided by two N sub S tans tangent phi sine 180 divided by N sub S, we get Tensile stress value coming down from up above, 237.42 kips. That's this one. Our cross-sectional area, 237 divided by 19 KSI. We would need two C channels roughly here and here with this cross-sectional area to sort of counteract that thrust force. Uh, domes under loading conditions. This is a Schwedler dome I made in steel with the computer software. And I put a lateral load on it. And so you can see the wind force is acting in this direction. And notice on this side, you've kind of got the blue, the compression force is going on for the hoops. But then on this side, you've got the tension force is going on for the hoops because you're compressing this side with the load, but you're stretching this side as it pulls apart. So it looks something like this. Load was originating from upper left to lower right. This was my tension side. That was my compression side. All right, we haven't uh, looked at wind forces for a while, but let's take a look at a dome surface for lateral load. Uh, dome is 20 feet tall off the ground with just a cylindrical straight wall at the base. And then the dome surface itself is up to 50 feet or the upper 30 feet. It's 100 feet in diameter. Um, open terrain. Um, again, eave height 20 feet, dome height 50 feet, framed in steel. Um, 
we're going to use the AFC method. If the building is less than 60 feet in height, we can use this provision. We can. Exposure category C is open terrain. Uh, importance factor 1.15, it's probably meant to be some sort of a collective stadia type function, which in some cases are used as areas of refuge during storms. People go to them. And so there's a little bit higher safety factor. 105 miles an hour is our speed based on location. So our wind pressure coefficients, 0 0.00256, again, K2, KD, KZ, TV, I, plugging in our values. Our KD is not 0.85, it's a cylindrical round tank, it's 0.95. Our V is 105 miles per hour, importance factor, plugging in all values, we get 30.8 times K sub Z. Um, that, that's a parameter that varies on height conditions and surface areas. So our standard mean winning force system would be over here. And this would be our value for a PSF, or PSF pressure, 26.2 from zero to 15 feet. At the eve height of 20 feet, it's shifting to 27.7. But as we go to the 20 to 50 feet at the top, we're moving up with these parameters to 33.6 PSF. The mid height of the wall is used for wall pressure 20 feet over two or 10 feet. And plugging in our values, figuring out our value pressures across here. What's the drag force on the walls as the wall vertical walls are being pushed off? We've got our Q 26.2 PSF over 10 feet, our gust factor uh, 0.85, our C sub F 0.8 for shape, and our area, total surface area of the vertical walls, 20 feet tall, 100 feet diameter, 2,000 square feet. When we push on the walls with the wind, their total drag force on the walls would be 22,270 pounds. When we look at the surface top areas itself, it's going to have different pressure conditions. You've got positive pressure on the top, and then you've got negative pressure on the bottom where you have potential suction or upward acting forces here. And again, whether you have an opening on the left or an opening on the right, windward or leeward side, you will have a plus or minus 18% of pressure, whether you're inflating this element or deflating it. And so if you take a look at our pressure conditions at the top on positive side, we've got a positive pressure at the steepest slope, 36.3 PSF, but at the very narrow, uh, slope conditions at the top, 22.9 PSF. And our overall worst case suction condition would be negative 36.3 PSF. Okay, I'll stop there for today. Um, won't have any homework from this. Do we have any homework for Wednesday or no homework? What do you do when you have a test? We have no homework. So all homework assigned today from lecture 16 won't be due until you come back on Monday. And we'll finish up this lecture and move on to that homework. So I'll take the rest of the time. Any questions on uh, lab quiz two, whether it's things you're working on or things you've had to rework and your submission today is midnight, please.